Well, welcome. Here we are again with another of our Viva Connection sessions. These sessions are our way of introducing you to our fabulous speakers that we have for Viva 2019. And today's a little bit different. Today we've got three ladies with us. They call themselves the Three Amigos. And um, there's a reason behind that. And I think we'll find out a little bit more about that as, as we go on through the session. But we're, we're really really delighted that all three of them could make it for Viva because it was kind of dependent on the trio. They're, they're like, they're stuck together. They're kind of joined at the hip, even though they live in different countries. We've, we've stuck them together. So we could we want them to, to, to come and speak to us um, at Viva with, about their experiences. Um, so really, um, they've all, all three of them have had a cancer diagnosis, a breast cancer diagnosis. And they've all been very supportive, one of each of the other. You may have seen on Facebook, they hang out and talk and support each other very openly. And we thought it would be wonderful to have the three of them come together and talk to us about their individual experiences through the lens of the three principles. So they're going to talk to us a little bit about that today, but con viva at the live event, they'll be having their own um, room and double session where they'll be talking to us a bit more about it. And it doesn't apply just to, to the cancer. It's obviously we're looking at it as, as any serious or any physical diagnosis. So I'm going to hand over, hand over to Sue, who's going to introduce us to the three ladies. OK, well, we, we, um, we pulled straw, short straws and Maureen won, so she goes first. <laughs> so we, Maureen is a coach, speaker, retreat leader, and her passion and business uh, Business passion is taking the fear out of cancer. Um, and then we, Kay, who's in, on my screen, who's at the bottom of the screen, is an independent celebrant. And when we were trying to pin Kay down, we found that impossible because actually <laughs> her whole life it reflects her belief in humankind and the connection through love. And we just kind of all melted, I think, at that point because that was so, so lovely. And um, Sue. So Sue's the naughty one, I would say, who's an <laughs> author, calls herself a common sense coach, and she's, she's been fabulous to have at Viva um, before, because she's very funny. I'm not sure whether that was part of the bio or not, but <laughs> the, her books, which are now gaining traction, I would say, and people are sharing, absolutely fabulous, down to earth. And um, so, you know, a little, a little t taste of, of, of who our friends and guests are today. So I'll just repeat what Sheila said and thank you all for being here. Mm. Um, now I can't remember what, who the short well, story Well, what's next? I mean, what, what we've been doing with all these sessions, is, uh, the Viva Connection sessions, is asking commonly asked questions. So, we, you know, we've asked, we've asked all our speakers so far, we've asked all of them, if they would answer a commonly asked question. Given, given the cancer common thread between um, these three amigos, we thought it would be helpful to ask them something specific to that. So the question that we're throwing out to them is, what's the one thing that made the biggest difference after your diagnosis with cancer? And again, it can re re um, relate to any, any type of diagnosis. So as Maureen York <laughs> has pulled the shortest straw, I'm gonna hand over the mic to Maureen. Oh. Well, thank you, um, Sue and Sheila, for inviting us all to, to get to Viva again and to take part in this thing, fabulous kind of celebration that Viva is. Um, and I think that is indicative of the fact that we are celebrating life between the three of us as speakers. Um, what struck me when you asked the question was what has what struck me all the way through my diagnosis, treatment, and thereafter, was that I had a deep and unshakable knowing, and I don't know where it came from, a deep and unshakable knowing that I will be okay no matter what. So I was interviewed by Julian Freeman um, shortly after my treatment had finished, and he did a short video of me. And towards the end of the video, I made a statement which was, and even today, if they come back to me and they said they had missed a bit and they would have to do more treatment, I know I would be okay no matter what. They, that sense of 
it's uh, I am I am not the diagnosis. I am just I, I I almost felt like I was floating through the experience, and I know the other two ladies have had vastly different experiences than I have because their diagnosis was somewhat more serious than I had. But my personal experience was that I was left with this deep and really uh, profound understanding of something I'd heard in the principles work for a long time about um, your well-being is innate and you'll be okay no matter what. And from the longest time, I didn't quite grasp that until the diagnosis. And then everything almost like almost like the jigsaw puzzles that I used to see the elderly folk who were coming in for their radiotherapy fighting to put in the last piece of the jigsaw. It all came together like that, like, like, the, like a jigsaw puzzle, and it all fitted perfectly. Now, I couldn't have told you the day before I had the diagnosis how I would react, how I would, how I would cope in inverted commas, or how I would be. All I know is how I was. And that's how it came, that's how I was. And it just, there was no fearful thinking. There was no, but what if type of um, normal kind of thinking that you would expect people to have if they go through a diagnosis such as this. I had none of that. And I remember the consultant who was explaining the diagnosis to me, thinking that I had gone into La La Land, that I was switching off, switching off and not actually uh, registering what had just been told to me. And that wasn't the case at all. Um, I think I baffled most of the medics and the nurses that I dealt with because they didn't see me going into fearful thinking. I, I had the most amazing conversations with them, but they, 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 they were still struggling to get a hold of where I was coming from. And if I could impart any of that to anybody who has just been diagnosed, my job is done. So that's where I come from it. And that's my, my one unshakable thing, my one undying thing that I take away from this whole experience is that it's actually allowed me to cement the principles more deeper than, than ever before. So that's me. I like there, Maureen, that you used, that you used the word undying. Yeah. The undying yeah. thing that you, it's amazing how it's in our subconscious. Yeah. But the, your, your, uh, what you said then about uh, your consultants and things not being able to stand your response to the diagnosis is quite similar for me as well. I think that on receiving, I, I was happier healthier fitter than i'd ever been and completely out of the blue there were no signs at all um i had my diagnosis um and i think for me something that was really unshakable was acceptance um i did have some fearful thinking i can't lie because as my experience went through they just you know they kept finding more and more cancer um, I had two types of cancer in the end um, and it spread through my lymph nodes on my right side as well. So as the experience developed, um, each time there were results, there was, you know, sorry, K, more bad news, sorry, K, more bad news. But I think very quickly I accepted that I couldn't change the diagnosis, but what I could affect was my experience of it. So I could let it define me. I could sit in a corner and I could let life pass me by. Or I could accept what was going on and do whatever I could to help myself as well as the consultants doing what they could to support me and help me as well. Um, and they did. Um, and just somehow I kind of reached, I dug deep and I reached into that part of me that's I guess it's the innate health maybe that you spoke about that's just untouched by what if why me 
you know, that has never entered my mind. Um, and I have two sisters, and given that one in three of us are likely to have a, a breast cancer diagnosis, uh, I'd rather it be me than them. Uh, and it was nothing I did. It was just really bad luck, really unfortunate. My cancer was hormone, hormone driven. Um, but I think for me, the thing that made the biggest difference was the acceptance. Mm. And um, just being human and reaching out. I, I showed my vulnerability, which is quite difficult for me. I've been accused of being super, super independent in the past. Um, but it was just about showing people my humanity and reaching out for them and inviting them to show it to me and show up for me. And that just really helped me. I, I had to do it for myself, but having those people around me just made me want to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Beautiful. I was going to say, Kay, we could be twins because my right arm also had the lymph nodes removed. So yeah. that's a fun thing, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah, I still feel it two years yeah. later. <laughs> well, I'm not quite so far down that line, but yeah, mm. I certainly do. Um, yeah, well, I've got nothing else to say. I mean, that's it, isn't it? I mean, you've said it all, girls. I knew I'd do it right in the end. <laughs> Oh, do you know what? I think, I think quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and I did during my journey, or no, I hate that word. Mm -hmm. I did during the time I went through chemo and the, well, before that, the diagnosis, the chemo and everything else that went with it, the operations. And um, uh, I, I just... I went in and out of some fearful thinking, um, mostly really actually fear of missing out, you know, missing out on my children, missing out on my grandchildren. Um, but it sort of was just a blip, I would say. Um, and, I, and I just went, uh, you know, into that fearful thinking for a little while, but it didn't last for very long. Um, so I'm, I, I, I think that I, I have, for me, it was that my mind quieted, is that a word? Quietened, quietened, is that better, Sue? She's the <laughs> word police. <laughs> my mind quietened so much. I got such clarity more often than not, but I also was very able to recognize that, hey, I'm a human being, and the experience I'm going through is, is just something I'm going through. And, um, uh, you know, I've always said that I, I, I was in pain sometimes, um, um, certainly through the chemo, the radio, yeah, all of it. <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you this. But yeah, it was different levels and, you know, of pain during different procedures and things. But, um, but I, I don't feel like I ever suffered mentally. I didn't, I didn't feel like I was um, in such a fog that, it, that I was in pain and suffering as well, you know, so, um, um, yeah, my mind quietened down so much that, um, uh, I just, a bit like both of you, I, I just, you know, accepted and I just realized that this is how it is. Um, and that I'm not in control. There is nothing for me that I need to do, um, except just be and, and, and live through the experience. Um, which I did, and I found that during times like during the chemotherapy, some of the sessions, which, as you know, Kay, you know, you can be mm -hmm. there from eight o'clock, well, I was there from eight o'clock in the morning sometimes, or six o'clock at night. Yeah. 
and um, I, I would take my, my laptop with me and that's when I started writing. Um, so I discovered something that I, I just am having such fun with at the moment, um, just running with um, in, in writing and publishing. Uh, well, I published my first book and um, actually I, I, this is hot off the press, but the second one went up today actually. Ooh. It just takes time for it to come through on Amazon. Um, but yeah, um, and the third one is uh, waiting in the background. So uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not going to say that I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like it's like you know. I have two special needs children as well, and I thought, oh God, you know, again, I've got something else now. Another club I need to belong to, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but. Um, but I, I have learned so much from it, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it, it sounds maybe crazy, but it was a gift, it really mm. was. It was a gift, I slowed down and I, I've appreciated, I appreciate life even more than I did before. Mm. And, I, and I thought I was slow before, you know. Still can't quite get to some of them that speak slowly, but... <laughs> That's not what it's about, is it? <laughs> I can really relate to that as well about the silver linings, if you like. Of, and when I talk about that to people, they look at me completely ridiculously, like, how are you completely crazy? <laughs> um, but for me, I, was, I had been living in France for six, seven years as a wedding celebrant, doing ceremonies in the mountains, absolutely loving my life met the love of my life finally um was traveling backwards and forwards to liverpool to see him and then boom every we, we just got engaged we were planning our wedding um and then the bottom foot fell out of our world um and he has stood by me every single step of the way and some friends that i thought would be there have not and others who i have just come out of the woodwork and been so incredible yeah um and i've through my treatment i've met some fantastically authentic beings who are just incredible people whose paths i would never have crossed otherwise and now i'm involved in a breast cancer survivors dragon boat team and we're going to barcelona in may to take part in a huge event and we go training every week and it's not about cancer it's about friendship and love and sharing and supporting and just being there for one another unconditionally and that for me has just I've, I've always had some incredible people in my life but to go from having a life to being in the UK having my treatment over what was in the end 18 months and will continue there's operations to come there's medications all the time bone infusions for years to come um but to leave my life almost overnight and to try and make a new one in a place where i was so ill was hard and um i felt like a very small fish in a very big pond but just through uh through this experience has uh allowed me to realize that essentially you know there is good and um and that's and that's the silver lining that life continues cancer doesn't have to define you mm -hmm. it can it does if you let it and ultimately, inevitably, at some points, it does. Mm -hmm. But hope is, is a word that I feel very strongly about because I think with hope, you can get through anything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I was, I was struck there when you were talking, um, both of you, around the, what, what, the words I had in my, in my head were appreciation for life. Mm. And... It's not that we, what we're what we're sharing here is is not a um, 
we, we had a blissful experience. <laughs> no. <laughs> Quite the opposite. Uh, <laughs> exactly. And, it, and it's not that your thinking doesn't go in and out. It's that because we have an understanding about where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. So I, this may sound a bit random, but I didn't have any major emotional reaction to any of it until um, last November. So that's, uh, I had the, everything happened in 2017. So November 2018, and we're, we're at Viva, and Sue and I had a, a session, and we were talking uh, to a, a, work, a, a breakout group, and then on the last day, uh, the lovely uh, Jonathan Shaddock and I were managing the, the, the wrap-up piece, the reflections piece. And I sat there and I thought, I've got nothing to share. Blank, completely blank. So I'm inviting people to get involved and this, that and the other. And then all of a sudden, out of my mouth, I heard the words, and I'm glad to be alive. And I broke. Mm. And I was so pleased that Sue was in the room. Because at one point, with us all being so disparate, I didn't even know whether I'd see any of you actually physically alive again. Mm. And it just hit me out of nowhere. It's hitting me again now. Mm. That, so this is not about sitting kind of in a lotus position and going, everything is absolutely perfect. That's not what we're presenting here. What we're sharing is that because each of us in our own way have an understanding about how life works. And it's about that level of <laughs> knowing. Acceptance, okay, is a really good word. Mm -hmm. Appreciation is another good word of what is. And it's through that acceptance, appreciation, or just being in that space, mm. what makes the difference. Mm. And I think that's the kind of underlying message that each of us wants to share with the, the audience or whoever turns up to be for this year. And indeed anybody else that sits and, <laughs> and deigns to sit in front of us at any other opportunity, because I'm sure we'll have more than one. Um, but yeah, that's what struck me with the whole thing. It's not a devoid of emotion or a devoid of reaction. Crikey, some of you two ladies have been through what I would deem hell and back, and yet here you are talking about this as though it's it's just what is. It's just what was. Yeah. And that's how you, that's how life showed up for us, each of us in our own different ways. Well, I have to say, I'm really glad that I didn't have to sit in a lotus position. <laughs> it's okay, I could I didn't think I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> My legs don't bend anymore <laughs> in that way. <clears throat> um, but I, I wanted to say something about, you know, what you said, Kay, about friends, um, the, you know, people that I thought also that were really good friends just didn't come round to see me, didn't phone, didn't even email. And I was like, what? At first, it was like, really? Um, and yet other people came out, as you say, out of the woodwork, literally. Um, I mean, one woman came every Friday to bring me something for the Sabbath and, um, and sat with me for a little while. And she just seemed to know how long to sit with me mm -hmm. and, then, and then to leave. Um, but but I wanted to say something about that because I sort of reflected on that quite a bit um, at one stage. And, and I realized, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy for, if we put ourselves in the other person's position, it's not, it's not really easy, no matter what, to know what to say to someone that has got cancer, let's face it. I mean, I have to tell you that when I first had my, my daughter with Downs, people used to cross the street because they didn't know what to say to me. And then someone spoke up and said, just be yourself and just speak to her. She just had a baby. And the same, I mean, I didn't just have a baby now. I mean, 
God, that would be awful. But I mean, <laughs> but you know, with cancer, the same sort of thing. You know, just be yourself. I mean, I, I, I don't even want to talk about it. It wasn't something I talked about the whole time. Um, if someone asked me about it, then I would tell them. But otherwise, it was the furthest thing from my mind um, to want to, you know, bring them down that road. There was no need for it. I just wanted connection with people. Um, which, I, you know, and the other thing I wanted to say, which was sort of struck me as well, and I've said it many times, that, you know, I live in Israel. Um, it's a bit of a controversial country, maybe. I don't know. I don't know if the country can be controversial, but, you know, people have a lot of thinking about it, I'm sure. Um, but I want to say that, you know, I sat with um, Arabs in the same room, obviously, and we were all in the same boat. There was, we just acknowledged each other and there was that feeling in the room, you know, that oncology room is something else, as you know. Um, but there was this wonderful feeling in the room that we were all out for each other. And it didn't matter who we were or where we were from, our religion, our beliefs, our ideas. We were just going through an experience together. And whenever anyone wanted something, you know, someone would, you know, get up and help them or whatever and, you know, go and get them some soup or something, whatever, you know, it didn't matter who you were. And, and I just found that was very grounding, actually, you know. I agree. I think that's really powerful. And I hope, unlike us, you didn't always have mushroom soup. Ours was mushroom. All the time, mushroom. <laughs> I think we had tomato soup all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what occurred to me as well as from what you were just saying there about all being, all sharing this experience together, is that that people don't need to say or do anything. Just being just knowing that someone is thinking of you, letting them know that, that you're on their team. Um, I, I call it my sort of own little team of cheerleaders that I feel that I've got around and I imagine them with their pom-poms doing their little dance for me. Um, but I think listening as well is just is so powerful. The power of just being and listening, not actually doing, having to say anything but just being in the same space as another person. And, and especially when I was going through my treatment, um, I had a friend that came to visit. Sometimes I was too ill to speak, um, which people find incredible to comprehend, but it's true. Um, so she would come over for the weekend from France, just bring her laptop, do her work, and every now and again we'd have a two minute conversation and then I'd go back to watching whatever rubbish was on the telly or not or but just having that connection with another human being was so important and that's all they had to do and I think that in life that is just being with others is uh to me, it's what life's about. And without those connections, I wonder why we're on the planet. Um, and as you said earlier, Maureen, I'm very glad to be on the planet. Um, and I want to be here for as long as I possibly can. <laughs> That's my intention. Um, but, you know, cancer will do whatever it wants to do. It doesn't discriminate. There's an advert on the television at the moment. It doesn't matter how much money you have, what you do for a job what sex, race, religion you are. Um, but what it has in common is that it affects human beings. And um, that's what we all have in common, that we are all people and human beings. And um, yeah, I think just being in one another's company and having those connections saves lives. It really does. It saved mine. <laughs> I feel that. I'm, I'm really glad to be um, in your company at the moment, and yours, Maureen, and Sue and Sheila, obviously, as well. Yes. Um, yeah, I got a bit emotional there. Yeah. <laughs> 
I just reminded, you know, some of my experiences having chemo when you talked about not speaking. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm always the joker, but uh, I, I didn't. I, I remember sort of things popping into my head and thinking, oh, well, that's a, that, that's a funny thing. You know, that's, a, that's hilarious. But I just wasn't able to say it. I just couldn't come out, even if I wanted to. Um, so, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm also very grateful for the connections I had. I mean, my sister was just absolutely amazing. And she flew over quite a few times to be with me. And um, she was a bit bossy, actually. <laughs> she kept telling me to eat, and I didn't want to eat. <laughs> but, you know, she was there. And, and sometimes we just didn't say anything. We just sat there, um, you know. And uh, you know, she came with me one time to the oncologist when he had to tell me that the operation didn't work as it should have done and I needed to have another one. And she just sat there and didn't say a word, just held my hand and I just could feel that warmth, that love just going through us. Mm. It was very special. Well, the thing that strikes me apart from just how generous you are, because you could easily not share this, is that I haven't had a diagnosis, but it feels like if that should be my experience, you have opened a conversation that there won't be the first conversation or the first facing of it. And I think it's almost pioneering work to have this conversation in this way because not only is it for people who have had the diagnosis, but it's for people who may have the diagnosis. And I, for me, that, that feels enormously, like it's like treasure. It's incredible. Um, so when you're taking the fear out of cancer, Maureen, certain, certain things I've experienced in my life was the first time, and there hadn't been a conversation about it. There was no markers, there were no boundaries. It was like being plunged into something, you know, 50 fathoms deep. And now it feels like, well, it's you guys for a start, you know, you get on Facebook. But, but it's more than that. And so I'd just like to personally thank you, but thank you also on behalf of, I, I will not be the only person to have been deeply moved by what you've been saying and grateful. So thank you. Mm, absolutely. Second what Sue says, and you know, thank you. Thank you, ladies, for being with us. Um, very, very <laughs> much deeper conversation that I imagine we were going to have today, have to say. But it's been very touching and I hope it's, it's very helpful to people. Um, I know they'll come and join in live at Viva. And as Sue said, but you know, Facebook, you're all there. If people want to get in touch with you, that's where they can find you. So we're going to wrap it up and say, you know, Viva Connections are here. We've used that word a lot today, or you guys have used that quite a lot, connections. You amigos, amigos. <laughs> Connection is very important, and that's what we see Viva is about too. So, thank you. And, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>